and Tracy McGrady are three of basketball's best young players. But that's not the only thing they have in common. They all made the jump directly from high school to the NBA, a jump that would not have been possible without a pioneer named Spencer Haywood. He was a superstar of the 70s, but his impact continues to this day. The story of Spencer Haywood, this week on Vintage NBA. Basketball has changed. It's always been a great game, but now it has a new spirit. He dunks like Dr. J. He might be the new ice man. The modern day Will Chamberlain. He looked like Magic Johnson. The future has arrived. You are watching what greatness is all about. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Vintage NBA. I'm Robin Roberts. This week, we profile Spencer Haywood, a player who made basketball history in more ways than one. He was one of the game's most talented forwards, but he also will be remembered for his landmark legal case that opened the NBA to underclassmen. Haywood turned pro in 1969 after his sophomore year in college. Thirty years later, another sophomore forward entered the NBA and became an immediate star. He's Chicago's Elton Brand, the 2000 Schick Co-Rookie of the Year. This week, Elton is in the chair, kicking back with a good book, The Tale of Spencer Haywood. You blaze a trail of sorts. Do you feel like a pioneer? I just feel like a man who had to do something because he thought it was right. My freshman year in college, uh, I had, you know, a course, and you know, I just was studying and, you know, looking in the NBA because I'm all excited and wanting to get to the NBA. When I read about his story, you know, that really, you know, inspired me and was like, wow. Well, he affected the history of the game. Spencer Haywood in his first year in the ABA was just so dominant. He won rookie of the year, MVP, all-star MVP. You know, that's just incredible. I can't imagine, you know, a rookie coming into this game today just that dominant that they're going to win all those awards like that. Oh, he's got a nice, soft touch. He puts that thing up there and it just floats. <laughs> Vintage Spencer Haywood card right here. Man, look at the pro. I don't even think he has shorts on in this one. This a little. Let's check out these stats, though. That's more important. 1969-1970. Averaged 30 points a game. Had 1,600 rebounds in one season. That's incredible. 80 games, 1,600 rebounds. That's, that's 20, 20 rebounds a game. That, that's ridiculous right there. You know, he was 6'8". You know, I'm 6'8", but he, you know, averaged 20 boards one season. And just watching the films, he just skied over everybody. You know, his moves down there in the pivot was just so, you know, fluent-like. You know, how smooth he was. If it was a bigger guy, he'd go by him. If it was a smaller guy, he'd just go over him. He had to turn around Jay to the baseline. So I'm trying to incorporate in my game. Elton Brand, the talented rookie from Duke, takes it right to Matumbo and lays it in. Met by Weber, finds Brand. Gets oh, right by Divas for the flush. What a fake on Divas. 26 points for the young kid out of Duke. Now, I don't know if I could work this look into my game with the, with the little shorts and the beads. You know, the beads, that, that's, a, that's a nice touch. That's an ill touch right there. Baby froze, they always in. The hot socks I like too, so. But Spencer had it going on back in the 70s. This is real vintage stuff out here. Hustling is the key. Yeah, I'm gonna try to hear that one. Let's see, I don't even know how to work this thing. Let's see. All right, I got it spinning. Put the, put the thing on first before I spin it. You sure? It's going to be like, screw it. All right, wait, what, what is this called? What is this? Turntable. <laughs> Take one way and go another. OK. Don't stand around. Remember, assume that every shot will miss, and there will be an opportunity to rebound the ball. That's true. You got to assume every you shot is missed. 
Um, you know, a lot of guys know about Will Chamberlain and you know Bill Russell, Earl Lloyd, the first African American player to play in the NBA. But uh, I don't think a lot of guys really know, you know, what what effect Spencer Haywood had on you know the history of the pro game. It's getting younger today, and you know he's the direct reason why. You know, he took the NBA to Supreme Court, you know, to be able to leave early from college, you know, to earn a living for him and his family. So I think a lot of people should know about you know, what this great player did. Now, obviously, Elton knew quite a bit about Spencer Haywood. He wasn't quite as familiar with that, that ancient relic known as a turntable. Long before CDs and DVDs, the thing you put on the turntable, well, that, folks, was called a record. In this case, Haywood's instructional record, which was called Play It Pro. It didn't exactly burn up the charts, but Spencer made his mark in many other ways, and we'll look back at his career when we return. Here you had this raw, explosive player who could score with the black shots, who could run the floor. We hadn't seen a player like that. I mean, all of these guys, I see the Magics, I see the Air Jordan. See, because I was the player that came in with that style uh, in my time. I was the first one to ever start that whole style of play. I feel that I made a real contribution, and I feel very blessed that I was able to do so. If you were to look just at his basketball achievements, there's no doubt Spencer Haywood had a very impressive career. He was an Olympic gold medalist, MVP of the ABA, a four-time NBA All-Star, and an NBA champion. But what happened on the court is just part of Haywood's saga. His career also included a major legal battle, and then a painful battle with personal problems. It all makes Haywood one of basketball's most compelling stories. These days, some of the biggest stars in basketball leave college early to play in the NBA. But 30 years ago, no one was allowed in the NBA until they turned 21, until Spencer Haywood changed the game forever. Haywood, and a foul and a basket will count. Haywood, one rebound after the other. He can score at will. He can do anything he wants to do on the floor, and he knows that. Spencer grew up in poverty in Mississippi. But when his family moved to Detroit, he emerged as a high school basketball star. And in 1968, while still a teenager, Haywood was selected for the U.S. Olympic basketball team. 19-year-old Spencer Haywood of Trinidad Junior College, the youngest lad ever to make an American Olympic basketball team, is the star of this one. To this day, I'll never forget him driving to the hoop, and he dunked over them. You know, the one-handed swoop, the Connie Hawkins, the Julia Serving, the Michael Jordan type of move, and it was, took your breath away. And right then and there, you knew that this guy was something special. Needing a way to support his mother and 10 brothers and sisters, Spencer, after two years in college, signed an enormous contract with the Denver Rockets of the ABA. He became the first underclassman to play in a professional league. Though just 19, he dominated the ABA. I was Rookie of the Year, Most Valuable Player, Leading Scorer, Leading Rebounder, uh, Most Valuable Player in the All-Star Game. Best guy in the league, no question. I mean, just not in, in awards, he was the best by far. After his sensational rookie season in Denver, Spencer tried to jump leagues and play for the Seattle Supersonics. His case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Haywood was opposed by the NBA which was trying to preserve its rule that no underclassmen could enter the league. That was a trying time for me, and it was, you know, being the first, it was a hard time. And then, uh, you know, you're sticking your neck out there, it's, it's tight. After missing most of the 1971 season, Spencer won his battle. The Supreme Court ruled that he had the right to play in the NBA. Haywood brought his blend of size, speed, and agility to the Sonics. Sensational play, one of the game's all-time plays. He was named to four all-star teams and led Seattle to the playoffs under fabled coach Bill Russell. He used uh, a lot of spin moves, which is now you see the guards using. Well, he was a forward using those moves, and so that made him very effective. Well, number one, he was so big, and he was very graceful, so you really needed a lot of help on him. Um, you know, as a, uh, as with him being an offensive player. Here you had this raw, explosive player who could score, who could block shots, who could run the floor. We hadn't seen a player like that. 
After the 1975 season, Haywood was traded to New York, where fans looked to him to revive the Knicks championship tradition. Spencer came in as an individual who was expected to just carry the franchise. But those high expectations soon faded. It was clear that Haywood alone could not restore the Knicks' glory. They didn't have a team around them, so uh, it was very difficult for them. Uh, they said, well, you're going to be, you're going to be the Bill Bradley. I was the small forward. Then they switched and said, now I want you to play the Dave the Busher type. You're going to be that one. Then, later, I'm going to be Willis Reed. And I was never Spencer Haywood. As his time with the Knicks became a disappointing struggle, Spencer was increasingly drawn to the temptations of New York. When he was in Seattle, he was in a much more secure environment. When he came to New York, he was able to get caught up in the lifestyle. Haywood's attraction to the jet-set lifestyle led to an eight-year spiral of substance abuse, and his once world-class skills quickly diminished. Traded from team to team, he found himself out of the league by age 33, a has-been who could have been one of the greatest ever. I watched myself go from uh, a player of great potential to a nothing of a player. But after going through rehab, Spencer began to turn his life around. He returned to Detroit and started his own foundation, teaching job skills to inner city residents. And thank you so very much for all the opportunities you provided. Yeah, well, you know, we got the grant this morning. Uh, for the public housing to do this program and other programs as well. When I see people in the computer classes and I see people in different programs, I see people in this apartment complex who are now getting a fresh start, that's me. With his life back on track, Spencer also has the satisfaction of knowing his legacy has been recognized. Dr. J and I got a chance to sit down and we was talking about our career. And he also said, I never thanked you for what you did for me. And I was like, what did I do for you? He said, no, I'm talking about the hardship. I never thanked you. Uh, particularly the younger fellows don't realize what he did to embellish their careers and make their opportunities a lot more uh, open. Looking back, Spencer says he has no regrets about his life, that everything he went through helped make him the person he is today. And he's proud of his legal victory, saying it changed sports as we know it. Haywood paved the way for many other underclassmen, including some of the NBA's greatest players, like Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, and Isaiah Thomas. Up next, we'll look at some other athletes who took a stand. But first, a flashback to Spencer's first year in Seattle, 1971. While Spencer Haywood had big victories on the court, his biggest came in the Supreme Court. It was a ruling that undergraduates could play in the NBA. Now, after surfing the net, we found an interview with Spencer about why he challenged the case. He said he came up with the idea after talking with law students from the University of Detroit. As he put it, tennis players could turn pro at any age. Why should basketball players be any different? Spencer took a stand and won joining a legacy of athletes whose victories weren't limited to the playing fields. Jesse Owens won four gold medals at the 1936 Berlin Olympics to the chagrin of Adolf Hitler. The Nazi leader hoped to show that Germany's Aryan people were the dominant race, but Owens helped shatter that myth. In 1947, Jackie Robinson broke baseball's color barrier. The game's first African-American player faced taunting and bigotry, but he stood up to the pressure and blazed a trail for others to follow. Muhammad Ali was stripped of his heavyweight title in 1967 for refusing to fight in Vietnam. After three and a half years in boxing exile, Ali took his case to the Supreme Court and was permitted to return to the ring in 1970. At the 68 Olympics in Mexico City, Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their fist in a black power salute on the victory stand. 
The American sprinters who were protesting racism were banned from the Olympics, and their action caused an international controversy. Kurt Flood starred for the Cardinals, but he's best remembered for fighting baseball's reserve clause, which barred players from playing for the team of their choice. His lawsuit led to free agency and the big money contracts of today. Athletes were taking on the power structure in the 60s and 70s, just as others were doing in the rest of society. And the NBA certainly had its share of rebels, as Spencer Haywood remembers. Everything was different. Everybody had to put a stamp on everything at that period. I remember Pat Riley with the dark glasses and the long hair, Bill Jackson and all of us. You know, we were like sort of tripping like hip hippies in a way and listening to our music loud and, and it was sort of individual stuff going on. And I think there is a correlation uh, in the culture that was going on between that and what the players, because people were really challenging authority. And the players were willing to challenge authority, willing not to do, want to do different kinds of ways of approaching the game. So everybody was sort of finding their way and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, enjoying a new found freedom. But as life in America became more politicized, many athletes found themselves caught in the middle. There was a lot of tensions going on. A lot of people were pulling us, you know. You were uncomfortable with those things because, I mean, you, you, you knew that you could make some changes, some significant changes, but you wanted to play basketball. Now those were turbulent times for Haywood and other athletes. Spencer went through the controversy of his court case and also jumping from the ABA to the NBA. But things finally seemed to settle down when he arrived in Seattle, where he enjoyed his best seasons. And we'll relive one of his vintage games from the 75 playoffs when we return. Stay with us. By the early 70s, Spencer Haywood's legal fight was behind him. He could focus on playing basketball, and he was playing as well as anyone in the game. A four-time All-Star in Seattle, Haywood led the Sonics to their first ever playoff berth in 1975. The team, coached by Hall of Famer Bill Russell, faced Golden State in the Western Conference semifinals. And Game 4 is a subject of this week's Airwave Archive. The Warriors lead two games to one as we join Frank Lieber and Lynn Shackelford in Seattle. Of the Golden State Warriors off to a sensational start in the playoffs to top off his best season ever. Keith Wilkes of the Warriors, the choice of many as the NBA's Rookie of the Year. Seven foot two inch Tom Burleson of Seattle, one of six rookies who have sparkled in the Sonics' first playoff appearance ever. And Captain Spencer Haywood of the Sonics. All key ingredients of today's Western Conference playoff game between Seattle and Golden State. Hold up, hold William up, Felton up. Russell. Candidate for Coach of the Year with the job that he's done with this young Seattle team. Featured six rookies. There's never been a team that's gotten into the NBA playoffs with that many rookies. And the Brown, who was out of a firecracker in the second period when he scored 17 of his 19 points, is back in the contest. That's him, number 32. Haywood. Seattle now has a chance to break the game wide open. Unless, of course, Rick Barry or someone for Golden State should get the hot hand. Keith Wilkes getting away from Haywood. Charlie Johnson, the open man, he's got 12. 65-55. Brown. Johnson all over him. Underneath to Burleson. Rick Barry. Collision there with Barry. Yeah, Barry was helping out from the weak side. He kind of fell back, not only trying to avoid a foul, but hopefully getting a charge call on Burleson. Johnson, who's been the only warrior to hit here in the second half, really. Barry has been shooting. Johnson again, this time missing, and Haywood grabs another rebound. Sonics continue to control the backboards. Yep, they're the aggressive team. They're dominating the backboards, and they're picking up confidence here as the game progresses. Brown. Bounces right to Haywood. Everything going right for Seattle. Good hit the one-hander, and Ray grabs the next one. We'll see what Golden State does on offense. I think Rick Barry start, got to start taking some shots, and obviously hitting them as well. Keith Wilkes has a clear shot from 22 feet. Haywood, one rebound after the other, two on one. 
Brown off to Skinner. Let's see, goaltending or a foul? No, it's a foul on uh, Golden State. Loose ball foul. Fred Brown tried to delay until the last second to pass off to the man underneath. It was an outstanding block by Clifford Ray that time. The foul went to number 10, Charlie Johnson. Haywood. Mullins with the rebound. Three on three situation. Johnson back to Mullins. Wilkes. Nice move to the basket by Keith Wilkes. Now Golden State, maybe because Seattle's defense is running up a little, is starting to score more. But to get back into the game, they're going to have to stop Seattle. Clark. Ray, good position on Bullison that time to grab the rebound down to Perry. And the oh, second oh, basket of the game. Second layup. 65-59, and now Russell on his feet calling timeout. We heard during that last timeout some of the Warrior players saying, let's go, let's run them. They're starting to get tired. Well, obviously, that's what Golden State would like to do is start running the Sonics. Archie Clark with the basketball. Tab Skinner. Back to Clark, the crafty veteran. Only real playoff veteran that the Sonics have this young ball club. Fred Brown driving the lane. Trying to get his own rebound. Burleson has it. In order to start the fast break, Golden State needs to get some rebounds. As just shown there, they're not. Tom Burleson got it and put it in. No tough to fast break without the ball. It sure does. Burleson now has 19. 6 7 59 Sonics. Six minutes to go, third quarter. Wilkes. Off the Ray. Seven seconds on the shot clock as Mullins guns it. Well far. There you go, there you go. Now let's see who headed back. they say. Burleson can't believe the call by Paul Mahalik, the official. Mullins going to set up the out-of-bounds play. Looks like Watts is getting ready to come in. Very. Still has to hit one of those patented long jumpers. Wilkes with a rebound try. They're going to call a foul. It's either going to be on Ray or Wilkes. He'll go the other way. Barry, once again on that long jump shot, was short, Frank. That's the way he's missed most of them. It's the fourth personal foul on Keith Wilkes. <laughs> That's the second time today Keith has missed a shot that he probably felt he should have made. And players get upset with themselves, and they go too aggressively after the ball, and he did there. Penalty and effect now. It's the fifth team foul of the Warriors. Sonics have had only one team foul against them here in the third period. One. Haywood. Spencer Haywood. He was on the 1968 United States Olympic team and only the age of 19. He'll be 26 years old on Tuesday. Gets the margin back to 10 points. He has 12 in the game. Haywood injured earlier this season, but he has certainly come back strong. Ninth in the league in scoring. Average of 22 points per game. Mullins. Off to Barry. Wilkes. From 12 feet. Oh, 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 no good. I think we're going to have shoving called on Ray. That, that was an easy play to call by Mindy Rudolph. Clifford Ray definitely did push off. Rick Barry acted that time like he didn't want the shot. Looked like he wanted Keith Wilkes to take it. He's putting it up an awful lot for the Warriors today. Wilkes took over a great deal of the offensive slack when uh, Barry was injured for a brief period of time, scoring better than 30 points on a couple of occasions. And his play normally, though, is to compliment Barry. One plus one here for Spencer Haywood. Eleven point advantage for the Sonics. Oh! Charlie Johnson breaking across the lane to grab it. Barry from the corner. Brown gets the rebound. Barry was short once again. Tab Skinner driving on Barry. Dickey getting ready to come into the game for Golden State. Watts to Haywood. To Brown, Mullins on it. Skinner with the rebound. Boy, there were three blue shirts underneath the basket, and somehow Skinner got in there and 
Put it through, and Golden State calls timeout. Sonics get a standing ovation from their fans as they have built their lead to 13 points with 4 minutes and 46 seconds left to play in the third quarter. For the first time, fans in Seattle had a winning team to cheer for, and leading the way was a man who knew something about winning, Bill Russell. In his second season as coach and GM, he had the Sonics in the playoffs. His star was Spencer Haywood, who finished among the league leaders in scoring, rebounding, and block shots. We'll get back to the Sonics and Warriors right after we test your knowledge about 1975. <laughs> Sonics were one of the surprise teams in the NBA. After closing the season on a seven-game winning streak, they beat Detroit in the first round of the playoffs and then gave Golden State all they could handle. Along with Haywood, they had an exciting backcourt with downtown Freddie Brown and the man with the headband, Slick Watts. As we head back to game four, the Sonics are poised to tie the series, leading the Warriors by 16. Fred Brown slows it down as he brings it across the center line. This was a must game for Seattle, of course. If they had lost this afternoon, they'd be down three games to one. Only twice in the 29-year history of NBA playoffs have teams come from behind after being down three games to one. Allison has a block down in by George Johnson. Some of the fans feel the goaltending should have been called as Hayward drops it. 24 second clock expires. I can't believe that they didn't reset it after that last shot attempt. <laughs> Some of the fans now, instead of yelling at the officials, they're getting on their own scorekeepers and clock keepers down here. 103-87. Dickey. Driving on Hummer. Two on the floor, off. Don Hummer picks up the foul before the shot, but it'll still be one plus one for Derek Dickey. Steve Tracy getting a rest. He looks a little winded, and while he should be, he hasn't played that much this year. In the playoffs so far, Bracey has played only a total of three minutes before this afternoon's game, so he might be a little bit out of shape. Dickey hitting on both free throws. He's got six points. 103-89. No more than three and a half minutes left to go. Watts slowing it down. Charlie Johnson ready to take a swipe at it. Jump ball. Seattle, of course, was outstanding when they beat the Detroit Pistons two out of three in a playoff series just before this one. They won both the games played here in Seattle, losing in Detroit. Now each team will have won and lost each one game on the uh, respective home floor. Seattle is capable of beating uh, Golden State at home. They've done it twice this year, which is more than uh, any other NBA team could say. Yeah, Golden State during the regular season lost only a game of 10 games at home out of 41 plays. Offensive foul called against Golden State. Six fouls on Keith Wilkes. Second Golden State Warrior player to foul out of a game, Bill Russell and his assistant Bob Hopkins. Obvious, obviously very pleased and confident at this stage. Wilkes fouls out with 22 points. Perhaps his best playoff performance from a scoring standpoint but he's had to shoot a lot more today because of Barry's inability to hit the basket also at nine rebounds yeah I think he probably had to take more of the offensive load that he would like to have three minutes left to play in the game Haywood knocked out by Burleson Seattle that time didn't run down the 24 second clock Russell with his arms up in the air says Spencer why were you shooting let's run down the clock a little bit more so you'll see him do that next time they get it Charlie Johnson 
over Haywood. Hitting from 23 feet. The lead is cut to 12. Well, stranger things have happened. And the team kind of laid like this down in the last couple of minutes. Brown. Shot clock is down to five seconds as Watts tries for the hoop. Great cut. Oh, he's talking about putting the soft shot up there. Seattle seems to run down the clock and then get any kind of shot they want to. And they're all dropping today. Phil Smith double teamed. Off to Bridges, who has come into the game for Golden State. Fred Brown with the steal. Into Hummer. Haywood saves it. Now slows it down. 15 seconds to go, and Watts just staring at that shot clock. Two minutes left to gay on the game. Ten seconds on the shot clock. Brown. Smith grabs the rebound. Long lead pass. Stolen again by Brown. George Johnson gets it back and put it away. 105 to 91. And now the chorus of appreciation rises from the Seattle Supersonic fans as the clock winds down the last minute and a half. Ten seconds on the shot clock. Brown from the corner out to Watts with four seconds to go. He kills it. 107-91. That's the time left in the game. 1.20. And counting. Of course, Flick Watts, that's 11 points in the game and his best playoff game point-wise to date. Air ball put up by George Johnson. Haywood grabs the rebound. He's out a ton of them today. Smith contesting him at the center line. Off to Brown. One minute left to go in the contest. Ten seconds on the shot clock. Charlie Johnson hanging on to Watts. 18-footer. Foul will be on Ferguson. For Burleson, that's five personal fouls. Of course, it doesn't mean much at this stage. But that's probably the most fouls he has picked up in the four playoff games in this series and the three against Detroit. And that is further indication of why he is such an improved player. Earlier in the year, he was playing much less, yet getting in foul trouble more often. He has really cut down on his fouls. George Johnson. Frank, as you can see, he likes Rick Barry. And they are the only two. Shoots his free throws underhand. Only two in the NBA, I should add. Slick Watts putting a couple of moves on Charlie Johnson. 40 seconds left to play in the game. All over but the shouting now. As this series will be tied. Good move. that half by Brown. When you're on defense like Golden State, you're overplaying, you're gambling. There's some, sooner or later, someone's going to break open underneath. Johnson. Jolly Johnson hits. That is 35 points for Brown. Top score in the game. His high on the year is 40, which he got a couple of times. They'll just run it down, and Golden State will run it down as everyone in the Seattle Center Coliseum comes to their feet. They love their Sonics this afternoon. Shot clock in tune with the game clock here. Five seconds. That'll last shot of the game, and Brown finds up a perfect afternoon for the Seattle Supersonics as he rings the bell at the buzzer, connecting for his 37th point of the game as the Supersonics route the Golden State Warriors 111 to 94, and will send the series back to Oakland on Tuesday for Game Five. The Sonics would lose that game five and the series as well to the Warriors who went on to capture the NBA title that season. It would also be Haywood's swan song in Seattle as he was traded after the season to the New York Knicks. But no matter what team he played for, there was always something that stood out about Spencer Haywood. Other than Julius Irving, I think he's probably got the second largest hands I've ever seen. Spencer Haywood. He has hands uh, big enough to palm Sunday. Spencer Haywood. Well, he can do things with the ball. With loud, I mean, he liked loud covers at the time. So, you know, his style was boom, in your face. 
My name is Spencer Hayward, and I'll be here until 12 midnight. He kind of played that way. He kind of dared and defied you uh, to stop him. And Spencer took that brash style to New York. But by 1978, both he and the Knicks had seen better days. On February 12th, they made a trip across the Hudson to face the New Jersey Nets, who were also struggling. Not exactly a marquee game, but still fun to watch. The Nets are playing at Rutgers Athletic Center, the Rack. Willis Reed is coaching the Knicks, and of course, Glenn Gondrzyk is on the bench. Trust us, you'll enjoy it. From the Airwave Archive, here's Gary Bender and the late Gus Johnson. 56-53, we're ready to go. Third period of play, the Nets with the lead. In that first half of play, leading scorer John Williamson with 20. Earl Monroe led the Knicks with 16. McAdoo had 10 rebounds in the first half, Gus, to show what he's been doing in the rebounding department. Seven for George Johnson. He's crashing the boards very good, McAdoo is. He's, it's taken something away from his offensive game momentarily, but I'm sure that he'll pick that up. We should point out that the Nets are not shooting the ball well at all. They shot only 39% from the field in that first half. And you can't beat anybody with a percentage like that. Yet they have a three-point lead. Spencer Haywood, who was shaken up in that first half, has come back, and we're glad to see that. Gets it off to Bob McAdoo. We have Beard, Jim McMillan back in the lineup along with Earl Monroe. Look at him, one big hand around that ball. And here comes Bernard King. He's been shut down in this game thus far. He hasn't done very much at all, but I'm sure that he's going to pick his tempo up, too. Boy, look at that pass by Porter, would you? There's King. He has 12 points. He shoots it so quick, he's got a tremendous release, and he ucks the ball very well. It's hard to block his shot, too. You know, when you're only shooting 39%, you're winning the game with hustle, evidently. That's all it is. They're playing the good defense. They're only giving the Knicks one shot at the hoop. Spencer Haywood backing in on George Johnson. What a move. Left-handed, no less. Excellent move by Spencer. Fake one way, came back baseline, and slam dunk left hand. He's got 10 points, 58-55. <laughs> and Spencer Haywood's got a few moves left, doesn't he? He's looking over here blinking at me. He better pick up his man. <laughs> <laughs> now it comes to Kevin Porter. Porter's got so many moves, and I don't think he knows what he's going to do. He's got 10 assists already. He's averaging 10 a game. He might get 17 or 20 tonight. And Bredikoff now with four points. That score is not right. It's 60-55. Here is McAdoo. And McAdoo's been fouled by Van Bredikoff. He's been picking up a lot of fouls in this game. He's already picked up number three, and McAdoo going to the line. Well, he knows where to go. Let's check that. It's Bernard King that picked up the foul. Two shots coming for the big guy with 11 points thus far. Well, McAdoo in that first half. 10 rebounds, 11 points. Hit four or five, not too bad for the field. He How did a little bit of everything. How do you play a man like that? 60, 57, three-point lead for the New Jersey Nets. Off it comes to Williamson. Jim McMillan, who started the ball game, he'll be leaving after a while for Lonnie Shelton as they share that spot. Here's Earl getting it out to Butch Beard. Back to Monroe. Spencer Haywood. There's just something about it. Gary, you can feel it, an athlete on the floor, when he knows it's going good for him, he doesn't mind taking that shot because he says, I've got it going. Look at this score, would you? Seattle, one point behind the Sixers at halftime. Well, Lenny Wilkins has got that crew going there for real. And look at George Johnson put one away. Beautiful pass. King penetrates with the ball, pulls all the big men off, lays it back to George Johnson, who crashes for the slam dunk. You know, the Nets have only won 11 games, but this is a much better club than that club of a year ago. Well, the record indicates that they're bad, but they're not that bad. They're going to be a fine ball club once they start. McAdoo, a little too tough with that shot. Off it comes to Porter. How about that? He knows how to take you to the hoop. He knows how to penetrate. He knows what he can do. McAdoo has been fouled by Johnson. He did the best... Let's go back to that previous basket by Kevin, Kevin Porter. Porter. comes down. He fakes like he's going to give it to Bernard King. Pulls him off and goes all the way. 9-17 to go. Third quarter, 64-59. New Jersey with the lead. And this crowd has seen a really outstanding basketball game. The Nets said this is a big game to us. They were, you know, they just weren't mincing any words. Kevin Lockery said we're growing up in the same environment with the Knicks. We need this game. It's important to us. And you can believe it now, the and way they came a, back. It's, it's shown. It's been a very gutty performance by both teams. I think 
I would have to give the edge to the uh, Nets as far as the hustle is concerned because they fought and rallied back and they're still in this basketball game. All right, now Phil Jackson is coming in for the first time for New York. Howard Porter is checking in for the Nets. We have King, Jackson, Porter, George Johnson, Beard, Monroe, Jackson, McAdoo, and Lonnie Shelton. There goes Jackson. He's a defensive specialist. He's going to put all the pressure in the world he can on Kevin Porter. Jackson has tremendous ball and he's an excellent defense. That's he's a good move. I like that. Right. All right. One second. We're going to get a shot. Williamson shot. It's good. It's good. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. 43 points falling out of bounds. Williamson got it away. And the Nets have won it. Hell of a game. One. 12 to 110. Let's look at it again, Gus. Man's playing him right here. He throws the ball down. Jackson does a super job on the defense. Williamson's in a three-point area. Fades back, falling out of bounds. Throws a 40, 30-footer in. Hits nothing but the net. They deserve the win. So Super John Williamson saves the day for the Nets to the delight of fans in Piscataway, New Jersey. The team would move to the Meadowlands three years later. As for Spencer Haywood, he would also be on the move. He was traded the following season to the Jazz before winding down his career with the L.A. Lakers. Today, there are some players who have taken Haywood's legacy into their own hands, literally. We'll explain, so come on back. When Spencer Haywood was at his best, there was just no stopping him. He was a forward who could shoot from the outside and dominate inside. His first year in the ABA, Spencer averaged 30 points and 19 boards, as he was named both Rookie of the Year and MVP. Now, I know, I know, we've touched on versatile forwards before in this segment, but here are some others who are reminiscent of Haywood. We've got some great video to show you. We start off back in the 50s with the Hawks' Bob Pettit, the greatest forward of his generation. Pettit was a two-time league MVP and always among the league leaders in both scoring and rebounding. He was the first NBA player to reach 20,000 points. The 60s brought Lucius Jackson, the man who some felt inspired the term power forward. At 6'9", Luke was a ferocious defender and rebounder, and he teamed up with Will Chamberlain on one of the greatest teams of all time, the 67 NBA champion Sixers. Today, many fans think of Rudy Tomjanovich as a head coach of the Rockets. Well, he is, but Rudy T also had a stellar playing career as a forward in Houston. He was a five-time NBA All-Star who still ranks third on the Rockets' all-time scoring list. Then there was the Hawk, Connie Hawkins, who soared to the hoop in both the ABA and the NBA. He not only had flair, but also versatility. Along with the scoring and rebounding, Connie had huge hands that helped him be a great passer as well. Dan Roundfield was also well-rounded at the forward position. Dan played 12 years in the NBA with his best season coming in Atlanta. He was solid in all phases, especially defense, and was a three-time selection to the all-defensive team. In the 80s, X marked the spot in Seattle as in Xavier McDaniel. He was known as one of the league's toughest players, but had plenty of all-around talent to go along with his toughness. Now, as for Spencer Haywood, one reason he was so effective, the size of his hands, they were huge. They helped him control the ball. And today, that quality has been handed down to a few other players. Robert Trailer has some huge hands, and he can just grab the ball and dunk it any time with both hands. Shaq is, uh, is pretty amazing. I mean, he, he, can, uh, he makes the ball look real small. And, uh, I'd say he's probably the closest thing. Gordon Stork still probably has uh, very strong and powerful hands. He goes up and palms them with one hand. Chris Webber, I think, is probably the one that comes to mind. And the only one that comes to mind just like that is the only player right now that I think does things with the ball because of his hands. Oh, by Weber, man, was that emphatic. That was one of the most spectacular plays of the season. You talk about a big man with great hands, Chris Weber. Man, see Webb doing his thing. 
If you want to give us your thoughts on Spencer Haywood or any players who compare to him, hands or otherwise, just drop us an email. We always love hearing from you. You'll find Vintage NBA in the history section of NBA.com. You can also read Spencer's bio and find out which glamorous supermodel he was married to in the 70s. Uh, that's going to make you look. I know it will. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Spencer Haywood retired from the NBA in 1983. He returned to Detroit to start his foundation aimed at teaching job skills and helping kids stay off drugs. Today, Spencer still lives in the Detroit area, working in the automotive and real estate industries. His basketball brilliance has faded, but his impact continues as a stand he took some 30 years ago will shape the NBA for many years to come. Thanks for watching Vintage NBA, everyone. I'm Robin Roberts, and we'll look for you again next time. Take care.